Father, when David was in a very, very tough spot, he cried out to you. When life gets hard, when life gets difficult, when life threatens to crush us because of our own uh, failure, our own foolishness, or because of something um, outside of us, just circumstances, unforeseen things come into our lives. When these things come and they uh, break us and they crush us and they threaten to undo us and we have a sense that we're very, very close to breaking down, we're grateful that this is not the norm in life, but there are episodes of this as we go through life. In Psalm 57, David was in one of those situations, and he said, I will cry to God most high, to God who accomplishes all things for me. He will sin from heaven and save me. And I recall one of the old Puritan sages restating that in this way, I will cry to God most high, to God who is the transactor of all of my affairs. He will sin from heaven and save me. We, we all have lives that are multifaceted. There are uh, many transactions in our lives. Uh, transactions often speak of financial interactions, but there are relational transactions. There are career transactions. Uh, there are health transactions. There are all of these transactions of life. And sometimes it seems that all is against us. It seems that you are distant, and it seems that you have forgotten us in our pit, in the place we do not want to be. That's why David said, I cry to God most high, to God who is the transactor of all of my affairs. I thank you, Lord, tonight that you know the heart and situation of every man. You know the affairs of every man. You know the issues of every man. You know the pressures. You know the concerns, the fears, the decisions that are on the immediate plate that have to be decided soon. How grateful we are that you are bigger than us and how grateful we are that even as we make the best decisions that we can, that your sovereignty and your providence is watching over us and governing us. And even when we make the wrong choice, you use that in our lives. Wrong, wrong choices, the mistakes of our lives are never wasted by you. We're responsible for them. But you take those and you weave them. And when we are teachable, you use them to make us better men. N none of us have uh, gotten all of our transactions right. Uh, no one's batting a thousand here financially on decisions. No one's batting a thousand on relationships. No one's batting a thousand when it comes to sexual temptation. We, we have all fallen. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. But we thank you for Christ, our Savior, that he has given his life on our behalf. He took our punishment upon him. Your wrath went upon him instead of us, and we Trust in him alone for the forgiveness of our sins. And we thank you that not only does he forgive us from our sins, but he leads us through life and he repairs and mends our lives and puts them back together again. So for every man, for whatever is on his mind and heart as he walked in this room, 
where he's feeling the pressure and feeling the crunch, we say as a group that we will cry to God Most High, to God who is the transactor of all of our affairs. He will send from heaven and save us. And for that, we thank you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight, we finish Ecclesiastes. This to me is a, uh, this, this is a, this has been a fascinating book. And it, it has been one of the most difficult books I've ever studied. But the more you get into it, the more you understand it. And I have to say, I have a tremendous appreciation for this book that I didn't have prior to the study. In chapter 12, he's given us a lot of material. He's covered all kinds of stuff. He's covered all kinds of subjects, the things that entice us, the things that we think make life um, important and make life significant and make uh, our lives um, uh, meaningful, uh, wealth, more wealth, uh, more stuff. Um, um, the praise of men, all this stuff he explores. He comes to the conclusion that it's all emptiness and it's all vanity and it's all a waste of time unless you know the living God who created you and has a purpose for your life. And until we come to know him, until we come to know him, we've missed life and we've wasted our lives. Uh, he, he, uh, if you ever watch in the Olympics, uh, the gymnastics, and you watch the uh, vault, or you watch the, uh, what is that, the horizontal bar? What do you call it? The parallel, they got, they got parallel bars, and then they got what? The high bar? I don't know what they call it. I didn't do gymnastics. I couldn't do a pull-up. But a lot of times in gymnastics, the guys on the rings, it's all about the landing. You want to you stick that landing. I'm going to tell you something. He sticks the landing. In Ecclesiastes 12, he sticks it. Um, Ecclesiastes 12, he's given us a lot of stuff, but Ecclesiastes 12 is all about remembering. Remembering. Uh, I I think in Ecclesiastes 12, there are three big ideas. I'm going to give them to you so I don't forget. It would be a tragedy to not remember what needs to be remembered. So I'm going to try and... uh, nail that by just going ahead and giving you the three big points up front. In, in verse 1, which, which I've got as Roman numeral 1 in my notes, I would put it this way. He's saying, remember God in your youth and take appropriate action. Remember God in your youth and take appropriate action. Secondly, the second main point would be in verses 2 through 8, Remember God before the storms of old age come upon you. Remember God before the storms of old age come upon you. The third main point to me is in section uh, chapter 12, verses 9 through 14. Remember God's word to get through the storm and arrive at safe harbor. Let me say that again. That's a little lengthy. Remember God's word to get through the storm and to arrive at safe harbor. Safe harbor is heaven. Uh, The older I get, the more I think about heaven. I remember being in the back seat of my dad's car, mom and dad, after a Sunday night service. And I was maybe seven years old. And the pastor had talked about the return of Christ. And, uh, it, 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 and, and what a great 
blessed event that would be and what a glorious thing. And I'll be honest with you, I wasn't all that excited about it. And I told my dad that. As I'm standing in the back seat on that hump, that transmission hump, and I think it was a 56 Buick Century, white with the gray on the side, cool looking car. Um, I remember standing on that hump with my, this was before government bureaucracy intervention. You had freedom in your car. <laughs> and if there's a sudden stop, you'd hit head on into the metal dashboard. <laughs> Those were great days. <laughs> but as I'm standing there at seven years old, I'm surmising and I'm telling my dad, well, I was not excited about the return of Jesus. And he said, well, Steve, why are you not excited about Jesus coming back? And I said, because dad, I don't want him coming back till I get my driver's license. <laughs> and I meant that with all my heart. And he heard my prayer and he forestalled his coming until I got my driver's license. <laughs> or so I thought. But the older I get, the more I understand why my grandpas talked about heaven. And my, uh, my great-grandmother, I remember her in her 90s in that bed she couldn't get out of, and she'd talk about heaven. The older you get, the more you appreciate heaven. Let's dive into this. Uh, this is very real, and this is very honest. And he's kind of picking up from where we last where we were last week, right out of the blocks in verse 1, because he says this, and, and our first main heading is, is verse 1, remember God in your youth and take appropriate action. Now, th these are famous words in, in Ecclesiastes 12.1. He says, remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days or before the difficult days come. Not so much evil in terms of moral evil, but evil in terms of difficult. Uh, Evil in the sense of days that you really don't want, days that are going to be inconvenient, days that are going to be um, a drag. They're going to be hard. They're going to be difficult. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come. Now watch this. And the, draw, and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. He's getting ready to talk about old age and the storm of old age. George Bernard Shaw once said that youth is such a wonderful thing. It's a shame to waste it on young people. <laughs> Is that not true? The older you get, the more you appreciate when you were young, the more you appreciate looking back when you were in the prime, the prime of your life, the prime of your days. The word here, remember, interesting Hebrew word. It, it has the sense, obviously, of remembering, of calling to mind, something that you have known, bringing it back to your attention, but there's more to it than that. There's a second idea with it. When he says here, remember, here's the sense of it. He says, remember also your Creator and do something about it. Remember your Creator and take some action. Make a decision. Uh, don't, don't just remember and keep going the way you're going, but in light of the truth, remember your Creator in the days of your youth and take appropriate action. You're not always going to be young. You're going to hit midlife, and then, what does midlife mean? It means you're half dead is what midlife means. <laughs> Nobody wants to say that, but you're halfway there, man. And then you just start kind of, yeah, I mean, you got some good years, but there's a point where you, you're starting to figure out, you know what? Huh. I mean, you'll get your skin. I showed Mary a spot the other day. I was concerned. I said, you see this spot? And she goes, yeah. I said, what do you think that is? She says, it's a, uh, what do you call it? I didn't even want to, I, I couldn't even assimilate what she said. Age spot. I said, oh, no. She said, oh, yes. <laughs> and she was right. I knew she was right. Just life, man. I came to know the Lord when I was seven years old. I mean, really, I was converted. I had a tremendous conviction of sin one night. 
as my dad and my mom and my aunt and my uncle, after they put all the kids to bed, we'd had a family day, relatives, and uh, they were singing some songs they used to sing. My aunt could really play, and um, they were singing these songs they used to do when they were in Bible college. And I'm in bed, and I'm listening to the songs. I'm just horsing around. You know, I don't want to go to sleep. And suddenly, I started listening to the words of the songs. And I'm seven years old, and I began to be convicted of my sin. I mean, it was heavy. It was heavy. Um, it wasn't manufactured. Be careful of trying to make your kids come to Christ. You're not the Holy Spirit. You want to give them the Scripture. You want to put the Scripture in their lives. But only the Spirit of God can do the internal work. And I'm just listening to these songs, these hymns, these choruses. And at one point, I got up, and I walked into the living room, and my dad saw me, and in his loving, sweet way that he had, he said, get back in bed. <laughs> then he saw my tears. And he said, what's wrong, Steve? And he came right over to me, and I said, Dad, I want to become a Christian. And my mom and my dad walked me into the bedroom, we sat on that bed, and my dad explained to me what this means, what I was feeling, sin, what Jesus did, that my sins could be forgiven. I remember that bedroom, that corner bedroom. I, I years ago, drove my kids by that house, showed, showed them that bedroom. Uh, I will tell you this. Uh, I've been in church my whole life, and uh, in my young years, in my teenage years, I remember... Uh, hearing guys give testimonies who had been in gangs and who had been on heroin and had been in prison and who had done all these amazing, horrible uh, things. And they'd give their testimony, and I would think to myself, man, I wish I had a testimony like that. <laughs> really? Wow, that's unbelievable. But see, I was young, and I was half stupid. It wasn't until I got older. The older you get, the more you appreciate the goodness of God if he brings you young. All, all, the, all what I was spared just by the grace of God. I mean, our, our hearts are all, hey, the heart is desperately sick and wicked. Who can know it? We're all sinners. But in my case, God was gracious to me early. And, and some of you guys have, have at times wondered, you, you've come to the Lord, but you came later in life. You wish that you could have come at seven, but you came at 20, or you came at 40, or you came at 60. But see, the point is you came. He drew you. He, he brought you to himself. Um, the danger of being young, we saw last week in the previous chapter, and remember, there's no chapter divisions, but they were put in just so we could find our place a little bit easier. If you look at 11.9, you remember this from last week. He says, Rejoice, young man, during your childhood. Let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood. And follow the impulses of your heart and the desire of your eyes. You say, whoa, that's a little dangerous. That's like throwing kerosene on a fire to tell a, a young buck male that. That, that, that's dangerous. Well, that's not all he says. Because he tempers it with the next line, yet know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. That kind of puts a damper on the party. You see, that's called wisdom. <laughs> Enjoy life, but look it, you're going to give an account. There's going to be a judgment. There's going to be a reckoning. There's going to be an explanation. Wherever you are in life, when you begin to remember your creator, do something about it. If you've been on the wrong road, if you've gone down the wrong path, even if you've known him, and like Solomon, more in midlife, you got tempted, you got pulled away, the enemy ambushed you and suckered you as 
He did Solomon with women. There are guys in here that were suckered by women. You knew better, but you got suckered. You got conned. Uh, better men than me have gone down. This is what the enemy does. But you see, wherever you are, if you're off the trail and he comes to your mind, remember him. Remember your creator and do something about it. Get back to him. Come back to him. Turn to him. Repent. Turn to him. Trust in him alone for forgiveness. He'll put you back on the path. This is what he does. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before, the contextually, before the hard days come. Before the hard days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. I mentioned last week a book that I had just gotten the day before. I couldn't recall the title. All I knew was that it talked about a guy who formed a relationship with Christopher Hitchens, the uh, <clears throat> atheist who became famous when he wrote a book <clears throat> called God is Not Great, and he put God small g. Uh, I remember reading that book into this Bible study and quoting from it. Uh, there, there has been a wave of the atheism over the last, what, 10 years, 15 years? Uh, Richard Dawkins, um, Peter Singer, uh, others. Uh, Hitchens was probably the most well-known, the most vocal. Uh, and what happened in this book, it's called The Faith of Christopher Hitchens. I, I will tell you this, this is one of the best books I've read in a long, long time. It's well-written, the story is compelling, it's respectful of Hitchens, and he died of esophageal cancer four years ago at the age of 62. It is a fascinating book. Larry Taunton, who writes the book, um, set up, his ministry set up a series of debates between well-known atheists and uh, Christian scholars, and they took place at different places, Oxford, uh, different universities in America, and they would sell these things out. And, um, and one of the men who was um, on the stage for the case of atheism was Christopher Hitchens. What happened was that um, Taunton, as soon as he and Hitchens met, they, um, they just synced. Although they believed different things and their lifestyles were completely different, in about two minutes they just hit it off. You've had that happen with somebody. Just kind of... Just you know, when it happens, it's unusual. Wow. You just kind of, you're on the same frequency, you know? And this is what happened. It's interesting, the more you get into the book, one of the reasons that Taunton uh, got along with Hitchens is that he understood him. Because he says later in the book, the reason I got along with Christopher Hitchens and the reason I understood him is that Christopher Hitchens was the identical twin of my father. Taunton grew up in, a, in the South, in the Bible Belt, and his father was the celebrity atheist in their community. Bible Belt community, you know, everybody went to church. Well, his dad didn't go to church. And his dad loved to argue, and his dad loved to debate, and his dad was brilliant, and his dad was an alcoholic, and his dad would take anybody on and make them look like a fool. And all the evangelists that would come through town holding their meetings, they all wanted to meet with Taunton's dad. Um, and when he got to know Hitchens, he figured out he's just like my dad. He loved his dad. He didn't agree with his dad. He understood his dad. He grieved over his dad. Um, he just hit it off with Hitchens, and they began to develop this friendship. And I mentioned last week, it's really interesting, because as they did a series of debates, they took two road trips in Taunton's Tahoe across the country. And what was unknown, it was done in private, is that this uh, brilliant debater from Oxford, this brilliant debater who would smoke a cigarette, who, who would have a cigarette in one hand, and, and uh, he always had a, a bottle of Johnny Walker Red. Uh, no, no, that's the cheap stuff. Johnny Walker Black uh, in the trunk. So he would have a cup of Johnny Walker black and a cigarette in one hand, and as Taunton's driving, Christopher Hitchens had the Gospel of John opened in his lap. 
And as they took these road trips, they were studying the Gospel of John together. That's pretty wild. Uh, Taunton says, I began to understand that uh, uh, Hitchens was a world-class debater. He was, he was a guy that was beat up a lot by bigger kids, smaller in size, and uh, was bullied. And uh, at the age of 12, he, he uh, dressed down a bully in front of a bunch of kids and ripped the kid to shreds, and the kid just walked off in humiliation. And that's when Hitchens understood he had a gift. He had a voice like Richard Burton, and he drank like Richard Burton. But he had a razor-sharp mind, and he began to read. Uh, Taunton said he was unbelievably well-read. Over the years, I began to understand. He didn't read deeply. He read for effect. He, he, read, he read for quotations. He read for concepts that he could use. He, he, he was getting ammo for debates. He could tear you up, rip you up in 30 seconds. But he said his arguments were pretty uh, elementary. But he was bombastic. <laughs> and he talks about when uh, Hitchens told him, they developed a friendship and told him, uh, I've got cancer and it's terminal. Same cancer my dad had. I don't have long. That's when they took a road trip and they studied the Gospel of John. Uh, let me read something to you. This all has to do with Remember also your creator in the days of your youth. Uh, Hitchens was in his, uh, he was right around 60 when this occurred. Uh, youth is a relative term. I used to think 60 was old. Now I look back on it as the days of uh, the prime of my life. <laughs> when you're 66. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, you know what I'm talking about. Listen to this. They're taking a road trip. By the way, Hitchens, Christopher, had a brother named Peter, a younger brother. They were on the same track all the way through life, both uh, great with words, both a uh, little bit smaller guys, bullied, intimidated, that whole thing, but realized they had incredible intellects, could rip somebody up with words. The difference is, is that at a certain point, Peter came to know Christ, came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Up until then, they'd been on parallel tracks. They're taking a road trip through the Shenandoah Valley. Um, Taunton says this. We're driving through the uh, pristine beauty of the Shenandoah Valley. Um, as we crest one of the old rolling mountains, we see unfolding before us a valley of sublime beauty in a strong, clear voice. Christopher is reading from the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John. <laughs> I mean, really, that's something if you know about Hitchens. He would just berate the Bible, just rip it to shreds. Here he is reading the Gospel of John, you know, whiskey in one hand, cigarette in the other. And they read John eleven twenty five, 25, uh, the story of Lazarus being, you know, Jesus raises him from the dead. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, even though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever believeth, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this, the King James says? So out loud, uh, Hitchens reads that, and as he reads it, uh, Taunton says in his book, his face lights up with recognition. He stops and he says, I know this verse, because he'd been raised in a school where you had to memorize scripture. He said, I know this verse, uh, but I do not recall its connection with the resurrection of Lazarus. Uh, Taunton says, it's a great verse. And I, I, was, I was sensing uh, that we had reached a defining moment in our conversation. Uh, yes, Charles Dickens thought so, Hitchens replied. And then taking off his reading glasses, he turns to me and asks, do you believe us, thou this, Larry Taunton? And his sarcasm is evident, but it lacks its customary force. I do, but you already knew that I did. The question is, do you believe us, thou this, Christopher Hitchens? As if searching for a clever reply, he hesitates and speaks with unexpected transparency, I'll admit that it is not without appeal for a dying man. Taunton goes on in this book, talks about his father, who was a committed atheist his entire life until he was on his deathbed. 
And then Larry Taunton talked with him again about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Dad, are you ready to enter into eternity? And his father said, I am not. And prayed with him to receive the Lord Jesus Christ in the dying moments of his life. Uh, Taunton says that uh, when you got to know Hitchens, there was the public Hitchens and there was the private Hitchens. He was a phenomenal debater and actor. He loved the stage. He loved to shock people. He said, uh, when you got to know Christopher Hitchens, uh, he kept two sets of books. You ever heard of that? Yeah. You know, the public books and the private books. He said, that's kind of the way Hitchens was. Uh, see, he got this guy. He got this guy. He doesn't say whether or not Hitchens called out to the Lord as his father did in his dying breath. He didn't know that. But as you read this thing, you get a sense that Hitchens, who, if he hadn't been smoking those unfiltered cigarettes, drinking all that whiskey like Diet Coke, he could have lived another 20 years. But you see, he died in his youth, so to speak. But he was remembering his creator by reading John. And he was pondering about um, taking some appropriate action. It's never too late to remember God and take appropriate action and do something about the fact that he is your creator. And you want to do this while you can because there's a storm coming. And when this storm hits, you may not be able to think as straight as you're thinking now. You may not be able to put concepts together like you're able to put them now. This is what you have in verses 2 down through 8. I'll start from 1 and read down to 8. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth. Before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. He's going to talk about the storm of getting older. He's going to talk about the storm of old age and the body and the mind falling apart. Before the sun and the light, the moons and the stars are darkened and clouds return after the rain. In the day that the watchmen of the house tremble. He's going to use, this is a metaphor. This is, this is a poem. We're going to go back. I want to read this, and then I want to go back, and we're going to explain what these figures of speech mean. It's very clear once you read through it what he's talking about. But this is a description of old age. In the day that the watchmen or the guards of the house tremble, and mighty men stoop, the grinding ones stand idle because they are few, those who look through windows grow dim, and the doors on the street are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low, and one will arise at the sound of the bird, and all the daughters of song will sing softly. Furthermore, men are afraid of a high place and of terrors on the road. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags himself along, the caper berry is ineffective. For man goes to his eternal home. Now this is clear. While mourners go about in the street. He's died. Verse 6, remember him. Before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed and the pitcher by the well is shattered and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. We don't talk like this. They talk like this. We didn't live in this culture, but they did. Seven, then the dust will return to earth as it was. Dust to dust, ashes to ashes. That's quoted at funerals today. And the spirit will return to God who gave it. So the body goes into the ground, deteriorates, but the spirit returns to God, if you know him, if you know Christ. Otherwise, the spirit departs away from God. But he's talking about death, the finality of death. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, says Solomon, all is vanity. Now let's jump into this and let's do it quickly. Um, in verse um, 2, This uh, picturesque language, 
Remember God before the hard days come, the years draw near when you say, I have no delight in them. Before the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are darkened, and a cloud returns after the rain. Uh, Ray Steadman says this. Uh, most commentators agree that the words before the sun and the light and the moons and the stars are darkened and the clouds return with the rain refer, watch this, to the fading of mental powers as one grows older. When you are young, life seems to stretch endlessly before you. It seems that you will never grow old. But suddenly, you're past the prime. And you look at yourself and you find yourself looking old and feeling old. The mental faculties are described here in terms of light. The mind, with its powers of reasoning, of memory, and of imagination, begins to fade like the dying rays of a setting sun. The older we get, the more we, we forget things. Uh, the reasoning power of the brain, perhaps the greatest God, gift that God give, has given to us, begins uh, to lose its skill. Memory fades. That is one of the first marks of old age. This verse describes the, f the failing of memory and of the imaginations like the stars that fade at the approaching dawn. That makes total sense. The clouds return with the rain as a reference to the second childhood, the senility that comes on in old age, which none of us want, but is part of the cycle of life. Some men die suddenly. Some men, to our minds, die early. A guy will have a heart attack at 46, and you go, oh my gosh, he died young. It is appointed for a man once to die, and then comes judgment, Hebrews 9. God determines not only when a man will die, God determines how a man will die. Your life is in his hands. My times are in your hands, uh, Psalm 31, 14. Some men die suddenly. But as Matthew Henry said in this description of old age, catch what Matthew Henry said. Matthew Henry said, some men die by inches inches. And none of us want this. But some of us in here will experience it. Some of us are experiencing it now. I had a young guy, I talked to him yesterday, and when I say young, mid-30s. He's under unbelievable pressure right now that's suddenly come upon him in his career. Things were going great until two weeks ago, and then it was a complete reversal. So we had some conversation yesterday. I texted him this morning. He called me. He, he said, I, I really got to tell you, I, I think I'm on the verge. I think this is what they call a nervous breakdown. And I would agree with it. And I said, yeah, I remember going through that. And he said, I'm thinking that I need to do this with this new boss. What do you think? I said, I think you ought to call him. Everything's changed since he's come into the picture. Yeah, it's just been terrible. I mean, I'm thinking, Steve, I need to tell him that with everything else I have, this, I can't do this. I don't want to seem like a failure. I said, yeah, but the fact is you can't do it. You have limitations. So does he. Every man has limitations. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I need to tell him, but he has not been responsive to me on anything. I said, okay, here's the deal. Uh, sometimes uh, in Scripture, people's lives were on the line. If Esther went into the king, it could have cost her life. But she had to get to the point and say, this is so important that if I perish, I perish. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to do that. When the king said about the fire, you don't bow down, you're going in the fire. Oh, king, we don't need to give you an answer in this. Our God is able to deliver us, but even if he does not, we will not bow. So sometimes your life is on the line. Your life's not on the line. Maybe your career, as you see it right now, is on the line. Because this is reversed fast, hasn't it? He goes, yeah. I said, okay. Uh, what, what we need to pray for, it, it, I think it's the right thing for you to talk with him about this and put it on the table. Now, you don't know how he's going to react. Now, here's the good thing. Uh, how he reacts is not up to him, it's up to God. 
uh, Nehemiah had to go in before the king, and if the king did not react favorably, Nehemiah was in trouble. Mordecai, same thing. Esther, the same thing. Sometimes in Scripture, you'll see that God, in regards to the enemies of the people of God who are against the people of God, it will say God put, put a spirit within him. God just puts an inclination in the heart of someone in authority over you and turns their heart, and those who are against you suddenly will give you favor. And I said, so here's what I'm thinking. I think you need to say, Lord, my life is in your hands. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this call because I think it's right. I'm expecting this guy to turn on me. And you may lose your job, but that's in God's hands. That's not in your hands. God runs that sucker. God owns him. God controls him. And he's going to do what Jesus says. So all you got to do is, is make the call and see what Jesus says. Your eyes aren't on him. Your eyes are on Jesus. He said, okay. And he texted me later. The meeting's this afternoon. The phone call's this afternoon. I said, okay. On the way over here, he texts me. It couldn't have gone any better. I'm shocked. <laughs> sure you're shocked. It could have gone the other way, but God intervened. God gave you favor. Next thing he said, but I don't see any way I'm going to get through this. And I couldn't text him. I was driving, so I called him and left him a long voicemail. I said, absolutely. Here's what you need to do. You can't see any way you're going to get through this. Well, look at what we said this morning is you make the call and you trust God for the next 12 hours of your life. Okay, now the Lord just got you through this. So instead of worrying tonight what you're going to do tomorrow, what you need to do the rest of the day, are the Rangers on? Watch the Rangers game. And then every once in a while, just thank God for what he did today. And don't think about it. Just don't even think about it. Just watch the game, get mad at the Rangers, do whatever you want to do, and then thank God for what he did today. And then you get up in the morning in Lamentations 3, this I recall to mind, therefore I have hope that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, that his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. As thy days, so shall thy strength be. So he got you through these 12 hours. So thank him, go to bed thanking him, get up in the morning don't give too much thought about tomorrow. Just show up because there will be a whole new set of mercy, FedEx, when you get up in the morning. And there will be new strength. And this is how you're going to get through this thing because this might be a while. This is how I got through the depression. You learn to trust him daily. And this is how you learn to get through old age. This is how you learn to get through cancer. This is how you learn to get through a divorce. This is how you learn to get through anything. It's day by day. Day by day. Does this make sense? Yeah. If you try to take it all on, it'll crush you. You can't handle that. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, don't worry about tomorrow. Each day has enough trouble of its own. If you try to take next week and next month, how the heck am I going to get through this chemotherapy over the next how many months? It'll crush you. You can't do it. So you take it each day, and each day there's a delivery of mercy. It takes time to learn that. Old age is coming. Man, and some of you guys are there. And your body, yeah, Steve, man, it says, yeah, yeah. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. You're going to get it a day, a day at a time. That's how you're going to get through it. You're going to have some good days and you're going to have some bad days. But you're going to get through it. Okay. I got lost. <laughs> Let's keep moving. I better keep moving. You're an Ecclesiastes. I'm an Ecclesiastes. <laughs> Chapter 12. Chapter 2. I'm missing, a, I'm missing a section here somewhere. Okay, I'm in 12. Um, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm just, uh, I'm looking at my notes here because, okay, now here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, let me read Kaiser here. Let's, let's go through this list, and then I want to give you Billy Graham's perspective on growing old. And then I want to give you G.I. Packer's perspective of growing old, because they're in it right now. Okay? Uh, you got all these metaphors. Stebman explained verse 2. Walter Kaiser, who's a phenomenal Hebrew scholar, uh, takes all of the images and interprets them 
if that guy didn't, I let borrow my book, didn't screw it up. There it is. Okay. So here's what Kaiser's got. You can't see this, but he's got these columns of all the metaphors, and then he's got the explanation. He's got two full pages. I'm just going to read them to you because, you know, you get into three, in the day that the watchmen or the guards of the house tremble and mighty men stoop, the grinding ones stand idle because they are few, and those who look through the windows grow dim. What the heck does that mean? All right, here's what Kaiser says. The guards of the house tremble. Um, the idea is, is that, speaking of the body, old age and how the body breaks down, okay? Uh, if someone attacks your body, if someone physically attacks your body, if someone throws a punch at your body, um, how do you protect your body? Okay, the keepers of the house are the arms. The arms and the hand tremble in old age with palsy or, or feebleness. As you get older, my mom's 88. She's in great health, but my mom's got tremors. And it's hard for her to get a cup of tea without spilling it, you see. It's just old age. And because of genetics, that's where I'm going, you see. A buddy of mine, we've been friends since we were 12, he just had to... Uh, sell his dental practice because about a year ago he started getting tremors. Couldn't do it. Okay. Next metaphor. Heroic men are bent. Kaiser says the legs are bent in feebleness and the knees totter. The knees totter. Yeah. The next one. Grinders cease because they are few. Can you guess what this is? All the dentists in the room said amen. Uh, the teeth lose their ability to chew food. What happens? Those looking through the windows grow dim. That's the eyes. The eyes begin to lose their sight. You get glaucoma. You get cataracts. Uh, let's look at... Uh, Verse 4, the doors on the street are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low. One will arise at the sound of the bird, and all the daughters of song will sing softly. What does that mean? Uh, the doors on the street are closed. Kaiser says that's the lips swinging or folding doors. In Job 41, 14, the lips are called the doors of his face of the Leviathan. Um, the lips fall into the mouth for lack of teeth. A street is a cleft between two rows of houses. The sound of the grinding mill fades. In toothless old age, only soft foods may be eaten. You better buy a blender. You're going to blend everything. That's what's coming. Uh, one rises at the sound of a bird. Isn't it interesting that as you get older, you lose your hearing but the slightest sound can wake you up. All the daughters of song sing softly. Well, what's that? You, you can't enjoy music like you used to because you're losing your hearing. Aren't you glad you came tonight? <laughs> Look at uh, five. Furthermore, men are afraid of a high place and terrors on the road. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags himself along, the caper berry is ineffective. All right, what's that about? Men are afraid of a high place. Um, as you get into old age, you're afraid of a, you have a fear of heights and you're afraid of falling. You're afraid of losing your balance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mary gave me a report this afternoon. My... She went with my mom to the doctor, and apparently my mom, the doctor said, you need to get this, this knee replaced. You had the other one. You'll do well with a new knee replacement. And she, she said, what about this knee? I fell. And he said, yeah, we can tweak that. But he said, I have a word of advice for you. And she said, what's that? And he said, don't fall. <laughs> with a smile on his face. He understood. See, you think about falling when you get older. You just don't have the balance you used to have. Uh, the almond tree blossoms. The almond tree, blo the crown turns white. That's pretty easy. He's talking about the hair is turned white with age. Grasshoppers dra drag along. 
when we had our property and our pasture, we had an infestation of grasshoppers. And up by the house, here and there, I'd see a grasshopper. And I remember seeing one going across our driveway. But he really wasn't moving. He was just, the, you know, the young ones were just springing and doing backflips and dunking basketballs and doing all kinds of things. The young grasshoppers. But this guy was just kind of. <laughs> this guy was uh, old. Yeah. The halting gait of the elderly as they walk along with their canes. The caper berry is useless. What the heck is this? The caper berry was an herb which was an aphrodisiac. In other words, sexual desire is going to wither up. Uh, fortunately, it comes last. Uh, Ray Stedman pointed that out. I'm going to blame that on Ray. Um, you can pop Viagra like M&Ms, and there's a point it's not going to do you any good. So once again, I'm just here to encourage you. But you know this is coming. Unless you die suddenly, this is what you're going to face. Looking at that clock. I'm going to go over a little bit. It's, I, I just am. But I still have, I'm still within my boundaries. So I said I was going to read from Billy Graham and J.I. Packer, but I also want to read from Malcolm Muggeridge. Muggeridge, we, we talked about him. He was, he was the preeminent British journalist of the 20th century, was, was the guy, was the Walter Cronkite. Uh, a pro, uh, you can still catch it. If you go to YouTube and put in Malcolm Muggeridge, he'll come up from his BBC reports. The guy was phenomenal, incredible. His articulation was incredible. His mind, and he could write. The guy could write. Uh, death was a topic about, he came to Christ about midlife, was an absolute pagan, living life under the sun. Death was a topic about which Malcolm frequently thought and wrote. At the age of 76, he wrote this, listen to this, like a prisoner awaiting his release, like a schoolboy when the end of term is near, like a migrant bird ready to fly south, I long to be gone. Extricating myself from the flesh, I have long, I have too long inhabited, hearing the key turn in the lock of time so that the great doors of eternity swing open, disengaging my tired mind from its interminable conundrums and my tired ego from its wearisome insistencies, such as the prospect of death. He was looking forward to it, being released. Spurgeon said this, Today we are like birds in the egg. Okay, they haven't hatched yet. So long as the shell is whole, we are not free. Death breaks the shell. I have never heard of a bird in its nest pining over its broken shell. No, its thoughts run otherwise, to wings and to flight and sunny skies. So let it be with us. This body will be dissolved. Let it be so. It is as it should be. We have been glad of it while we have needed it. And we thank God for the wondrous skill displayed in it. And when we no longer require it, we shall escape from it as from imprisonment and never wish to return to its narrow bounds or something called eternal life. Old age is not the last chapter. Eternal life is the chapter. Forever. Forever. Don't ever forget that. But for those who don't know Christ, it's death by inches. And then a separation from all that is good and holy and pure and true forever by their own design and by their own wishes. Billy Graham is, I think, 98. In his recent book, he wrote these words. Staying youthful was always a goal of mine. Nothing in me was attracted to old things, not even to my wife's antiques. He just didn't like anything old. When I was young, I could not imagine being old. I had an unusual amount of energy, and it followed me into young adulthood. When middle age set in, I dealt with physical weariness, but my mind was always in high gear, and it never took long for my physical stamina to return after a grueling schedule. I fought growing old every way I could, faithfully exercising and pacing myself as I began to feel the grass of old man time. This was not a transition I welcomed. And at one point, I began to dread what I knew was coming. And the rest of the book is about how he learned to handle 
old age. Franklin Graham, his son, said, my dad was always prepared to die. He was just not quite prepared for old age. Who is? It's the biggest, hardest transition you'll ever make in your life. J.I. Packer, uh, if you've read Knowing God or any of his under 300 books, articles, publications, Man of God. Uh, did an interview with Justin Taylor back in January. Uh, Packer announced, age 89, he'll no longer be able to write as he has before or travel to do any preaching. Macular degeneration is an incurable eye disease that, disease that causes loss of vision. While for now, Packer still retains peripheral vision, it's doubtful he will ever again regain the ability to read. Packer said this to Justin Taylor. Uh, God knows what he's doing. Rather than being paralyzed by fear or self-pity, Packer is confident that this comes as a clear indication from headquarters. Did you get that? This comes as a clear indication from headquarters, and I take it from him. This is why you study the Bible. This is why you study theology. It comes from him. God knows what he's up to, said Packer. I've had enough experience of his goodness in all sorts of ways not to have any doubt about the present circumstances. Some good, something for his glory is going to come out of it. That's how you deal with old age. God's at work here. He's going to bring good out of this. I don't like it, but he's going to bring good. I've been through other things I don't like, but he's brought good out of it. Justin Taylor said this to him. Ecclesiastes is a book of the Bible you have especially treasured and have gleaned much wisdom from over the years. You've said Ecclesiastes is your favorite book in the Old Testament. On this side of life, what has Ecclesiastes taught you? Does the final chapter of Ecclesiastes chapter 12 hold more resonance at this stage of your life than, say, 40 years ago? Here's Packer's answer. The author of Ecclesiastes has taught me that it is folly to suppose that you can plan life and master it, and you will get hurt if you try. You must acknowledge the sovereignty of God and leave the wisdom to Him. It tells me now what it told me 40 years ago, namely that we wear out, physically become apart. You get old, and getting old means the loss of faculties and powers you had when you were younger. And that is the way God prepares us to leave this world for a better world to which he is taking us. It's transition. The message of Ecclesiastes 12 is get right with God as early in life as you can. Remember the Creator in your days of youth. Don't leave it until some time in the future when you're not likely to be able to handle it as well. And now that he's blind and he can't read, he follows the model of his, uh, the man he admired, the 17th century Puritan pastor Richard Baxter, who lived with pain all of his life, but his old age broke in, Baxter made it a habit because he didn't have the medicines that we have, the pain medications. He made it a habit to meditate on heaven for 30 minutes a day. That's, what's got him, that's what got him through. Now, let's get to verse 9 through 14. We'll do this quickly. Because in 9 through 14, this is how you get through the storm of old age. Or how you get through the storm of anything. The storm of depression. The, 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 the storm of uh, chemotherapy. The storm of anything that you don't want in your life. Verses 9 through 14, remember God's word to get you through the storm and to safe harbor. Let's see what he says. In addition to being a wise man, the preacher, Kohaleth, Solomon, also taught the people knowledge, and he pondered and searched out and arranged many proverbs. He was a wise man. God gave him a gift of wisdom. 1 Kings 4, verse 32 says he accumulated over 3,000 proverbs. If you turn to your left, you're going to find a whole book of his proverbs that he carefully, carefully pondered, searched out, and arranged. They're nuggets of God's words. Now, this is important, okay? This is not life under the sun. This is the wisdom of Almighty God who created the sun. The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. That's what any teacher should do. 
That's a job as a preacher. It's a job as a teacher. It's a job in communicating to your kids. Find delightful words and the right words of truth correctly. Now watch this. The words of wise men are like goads. What's a goad? Has anyone ever goaded you in anything? A goad is a long stick with a metal sharpened point that they would use to prod cattle or oxen along the path. It gets you to give them a shot in the butt with a sharp stick and get them moving. You see? The words of wise men are like goads and master, now watch this. And now what did he say? The words of wise men. He is talking, we're going to see in a minute. He's talking about these Proverbs, the truth of God that has been given in Scripture. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, a prod, correction, training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. He's going to talk about Scripture here. The words of wise men, and he is claiming the right Scripture here, is a prod. You ever been prodded? You ever been goaded by Scripture? It'll reprove you. It'll correct you. Okay, and watch this. And masters of these collections of God's truth, you read Proverbs, you read anything in the Scripture, masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They would have a center post of tents. And on a center post of, tent, of a tent, which would, would nail the tent down, if you, so to speak, there would be a hook. And on that hook, which was nailed in, you would put the valuables in your life to protect them. Clothes, food, whatever, you'd hang them off a hook. Okay, no, all right, you got that? The words of wise men, Scripture, are like goads, and masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. What do you mean one shepherd? Who's the shepherd? Well, David's dad undoubtedly told him who the shepherd was. The Lord is mine. He's talking, about the, he's talking about God. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about the words given by God, given by the Lord Jesus Christ, which are in Scripture, which goad us on the right path, which enable us to keep moving and making right decisions. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. The collections of His Word, those who master them, you're not going to master, you'll never master the whole Bible. But you master certain concepts. You, you get certain verses. I talked about core verses a few weeks ago. You get certain core verses, and you hang them on the hook, and you nail them down in your life, and you live off of them. Does that make sense? Because Christ has said this to you. Christ has promised this to you. You see? Psalm 50, 15, call on me in the day of trouble. I will rescue you, and you will honor me. Have you ever seen him do that? You hang your life on that. You've nailed that in your, that you, that's your valuables. You hang your life on the word of God. You trust in that. Isaiah 46, 2, listen to me, O house of Israel. Listen to me, uh, I'm trying to go too fast. Listen to me, O house of Jacob and you remnant of Israel. You have been born by me from birth and carried from the womb, even to your old age. I will be the same, in, even to your grain years. I will bear you. I have borne you. I will carry you. I will bear you. I will carry you. Man, that's valuable. You nail that. You live off that. I will cry to God most high. Psalm 57, 2. To God, who accomplishes all things for me. He will send from heaven and save me. The eyes of the Lord roam to and fro about the earth, looking for those whose hearts are fully his, that he may strongly support them. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will help you. I will hold you with my mighty right hand. The eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it are saved. Those who know thy name will put their trust in thee. Those are valuables. Those are, those are valuables, guys. And as you go through, as you go through hard times, as you go through old age, as you're going through whatever the heck you're going through, you hold on, you nail those suckers down in your heart and you live off them because they come from the shepherd who cannot lie. And can I tell you this? 
I had guys ask me sometimes, where'd you learn those scriptures? In the worst times of my life. I didn't learn those things when everything was going great. I learned those when I was at my wit's end. Like that young guy today. That's where you learn these, and then you hang on to them and you love them. And you, and, and you love his words and you love him. And he's there and he's real. He cannot lie. I will never leave you or forsake you. That's how you get through life. Are we blessed men or what? Yes. To know him? We didn't go after him. He came after us. It's all grace. It's all mercy. It's astonishing. Astonishing grace. What a great God. What a great Savior. So you want to spend your time knowing what's in his book. And the problem is, we're, we're always, there's all this life under the sun stuff. Look at the next verse. There's a warning. But beyond this, my son, be warned. The writing of many books and blogs and Fox News is endless. <laughs> I kind of added some things to the text there. I broke the Word of God. You're not supposed to do that. But beyond this, my son, be warned. The writing of many books is endless. You ever read philosophy? You ever read some of these guys? Plato, Socrates? Uh, you read some of these guys? It's the wisdom of men. You see? And some guys, this is their whole life. They sit around bookstores and they smoke dope and they drink wine and they read philosophers and they talk about it. You go to Paris and that's what you do. That's significant. And then the guys that do that, the great authors like Hemingway, uh, you put a hole in your head. All the authors on Barnes & Noble that are on the posters, that, that, a lot of them killed themselves out of total despair. Why? It was life under the sun without God. And they faced old age and they couldn't take it. It doesn't mean you're not aware of them, but you just don't camp there. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the, in the who, who, uh, Psalm 1. I'm, I'm going to get it reversed. How blessed is the man who does not sit in the seat of scoffers, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor something in the uh, seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in, and, and in his word he shall meditate day and night. And he is like a tree planted by streams of living water. And whatever he does, he, he flourishes, he prospers. You see why? Because you're planted in God's words, in God's valuables, not, not the viewpoint of men. Not that we're not aware of these readings, not that we don't read, but you know what? You, you, we got to be taking our counsel from what God says, not what the world says. Here's the conclusion, 13. The conclusion, when all has been heard, fear God, keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. For God will bring to act every judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good, is good or evil. And see, that's it. That's where life is going. This is what Solomon found. Solomon got off the track. We talked about this. Got on the wrong track. I want to finish with having you turn to Hebrews 1 as we finish Ecclesiastes. Remember your creator in your youth. Uh, you know the great news about our creator is that when you remember your creator you also remember that he's not only your creator, he's your savior. And because of what Jesus has done, you don't have to fear judgment because the judgment that should have come on us, Jesus took upon himself. In Hebrews chapter 1, we read these words. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. He's the creator, Jesus. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. He upholds all things by the word of his power, including you, where you are in life. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He made purification of sins. Not his sins, he didn't have any sins. He made purifications of our sins, those of us who trust in him alone. He died in our place. We do not have to fear judgment because of what Christ has done. And no matter how long old age lasts for you, and no matter the deterioration of your mind and body, 
your best days are ahead. They're ahead. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard what God has prepared for those who love him. Heaven is going to be unbelievable. Astonishing. Astonishing. And it's forever. So, Father, we thank you. We want to remember you now while we can. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned each one to his own way. If we have wandered, we want to remember you and turn and take appropriate action now and come back to you. For those who are struggling, for those who are suffering, who are overwhelmed, hmm. be very real to them through your presence. And even when the mind goes and we can't remember your word, you remember your promises to us. <coughs> Thank you that old age is not the last chapter. But when it comes to an end, it's the beginning of the greatest chapter. And this is our hope. And it is fixed. And it is guaranteed through the blood of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.